Hi, welcome to another edition of This Issue. My guest this time is my friend Lisa Savage from Solon, Maine, a public uh, school teacher here in the state. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're a, we're going to talk about climate change today. Also, I want to talk a little bit about your work and education. But you lead a group called Maine Natural Guard. Your T-shirt uh, says Maine Natural Guard. Mm -hmm. Not That's National right. Guard, but Natural Guard. What is that? Well, the Maine Natural Guard is a campaign uh, that has gathered a sizable group of people that have signed on to a pledge to say, when people are talking about climate change, climate catastrophe really is a better, a more accurate term in these times, uh, make sure to mention that the Pentagon has the biggest uh, carbon footprint of any organization on the planet. It's larger than 140 countries. And until you're talking about Pentagon greenhouse gas emissions, you're not really talking about addressing climate change. And then on the other hand, when you're talking about security, when people are bringing up issues of security and why we need all this military, make sure to mention the carbon footprint and the um, environmental impact of all this militarism. You know, connect those two dots. And that's essentially what the Maine Natural Guard was created to do. Lots of people have joined in and want to do that. And you have t-shirts for sale too. We do, we have t-shirts. Um, we have a website, it's a Google site, so it's got kind of a long URL. I think you're going to put it on. But if you use any search engine and look for the Maine Natural Guard, you will see the website and you can order a t-shirt there. Yep. And you have some really great links to articles about this connection between climate catastrophe and the military's contribution. I do. I started uh, three years ago or so collecting any research or articles that I found on the topic of the military's impact on the environment. And um, so I have quite a collection by now. And what's been interesting to me is that in the last six months, there are two new substantial reports out every month or so um, you know, I, I used to add one every six months, and now I'm, I'm adding them regularly. So the resources page on the Maine Natural Guard website is a pretty good compilation of, of various people. Some of them are academics that have actually done the research, and some of them are articles, journalists. Um, and these are all making this connection between, yes. between the Pentagon carbon, what I call boot print, yes, and exactly. climate mm -hmm. catastrophe. Uh, let's talk about education for a moment. Is climate change being taught in the schools around the state? I think it certainly is being taught in Maine. Um, science teachers in Maine are probably the first people that really told me about climate change, you know, years back. I'm not, I haven't been a science teacher for many, many years. Um, I think that uh, school children, young people, middle school students, high school students, college students are very aware and very concerned about the climate emergency that we're in and really concerned about the fact that our elected officials don't seem to be fixing the problem. They seem to continually make it worse. Now, you recently have been in contact with some of the students, especially in the Portland area, that are part of this uh, uh, climate strike, can, student strike. Can you talk about that? Uh, sure. Um, I was uh, really fortunate to be introduced to, through a mutual uh, contact, Anna Siegel. Anna Siegel leads the youth climate strikes movement here in Maine. The youth climate strikes movement, uh, most people are aware, is an international movement. Greta Thunberg is a very high profile um, European uh, teenager that's, le that's uh, led that. And Anna just turned 13 on the day that she spoke at a press conference that we held for our conversion campaign, which we'll be talking about. And she told us that when she blew out the candles on her 13th birthday, she thought 11 years until human extinction is irreversible in terms of climate change and you know the uh, repercussions of the rising temperature globally and the melting of the seas and so forth. A lot of us in the audience were older and that was very, very um, impactful hearing a young teenager looking at 11 more years of future and probably not a very cheerful future as wars and um, you know forced migration and all sorts of crop failure and drought and cataclysmic storms. That's a pretty short time frame for somebody who's 13 years old to be looking at what does my future look like. I, I don't know if you've seen that photo online. I don't know who's holding the sign, but a young woman has a sign that says, you'll die of old age, I'll die of climate change. 
I think the young people understand that and they're pretty shocked that we're not treating it like an emergency and you know now you, putting all our resources to solving that problem. You have children and grandchildren, I yes? I do, I do. Does this make you more passionate about this concern? It certainly does. Um, my grandchildren are little, the oldest ones in high school, but some of them are quite little and I just wonder what kind of a future will there be for them? And do you feel like uh, the Republicans and Democrats today are stepping up to the plate on this issue or not? No, definitely not. Um, the, on the one hand, they'll talk about the Green New Deal, which could be a good thing and helpful. But on the other hand, they'll both sides will vote for the biggest Pentagon budget ever. What's the most recent, the funding for the following year is uh, what's? 800 billion 800 range. 800 billion range, thank yeah. you. Shelley Pingree voted yes for it. Jared Golden voted yes for it. Those are Maine's two reps. Um, when it comes before the Senate, I fully expect Susan Collins and Angus King will vote for it. They do every year. Um, it, it, so what does that you know, tell us? It tells us that they're not really treating climate emergency like it's an emergency and connecting the dots of, well, who's the biggest climate change producer here in the U.S.? What do you think is holding the four of them back, uh, Pingree, Golden, Collins, King, what's holding them back from getting on board this and really protecting Anna Siegel and your grandchildren and uh, the, the upcoming generations? The fact that money runs the U.S. Congress and campaign contributions from big, big polluters like General Dynamics are the very bread of life to uh, the members of the U.S. Congress, I think, explains it. Why do you think that the news media, which is mostly owned by corporations today, correct? Mm -hmm. And environmental groups, mainstream environmental groups, why do you think they've been so hesitant, so slow to recognize this connection between military and climate catastrophe? Well, it's a, it, it, there's a history to it. So part of it is not really the fault of journalists, although I, I do think they're um, at fault, and I'll get to that. But back in the uh, Kyoto Accords, um, the U.S. press, so this was when George W. Bush was still in office, the U.S. pressed very hard for the military of signing countries to be exempted from counting their uh, emissions. And they succeeded in getting that concession. Then the U.S. still didn't sign the Kyoto Accords. But that... Um, information blackout about a really important factor in this problem um, continued. It was partially addressed in the Paris Accords, I think that was 2015, um, in the sense that it's no longer automatically exempting militaries of the signing countries, but it is still not mandatory for the signing countries to count and monitor their military's emissions. So if it's not mandatory, it's likely that the Pentagon is not doing it, correct? Uh, the Pentagon is pretty concerned about climate change, actually, and the Pentagon is really worried about their 800 bases worldwide uh, being inundated by floodwaters if they're in coastal areas and so forth. Um, but, you know, to, to create an information void about something really important is the first step in controlling the media because the corporate media aren't, who do we know that are still real investigative journalists? You could probably count them on the fingers of both hands and you know, people like Julian Assange that really get us information and get it out there are literally tortured by uh, powerful government actors. So making sure the information is impossible to find, very hard to find, is step one, I think, in controlling the corporate media. And then, you know, secondarily, they're big corporations they're feeding at the same trough as General Dynamics. They uh, are under pressure from their, uh, you know, editorial boards or their own internal governance to um, not reveal inconvenient truths about the way things work in our world. You know, uh, it, it just blows my mind. Uh, I think about getting back to environmental groups, mainstream environmental groups. Over the years, I've heard this repeatedly. I'd like you to comment on it. Mm -hmm. Well, we understand how the Pentagon contributes massively to climate change, but you need to know that we have a real good relationship, working relationship with Democrats. 
And if we were to reach over here and take on that military connection, we would lose our special relationship with Democrats who are going to Washington. Shelley Pingree, for example, goes to Washington, supports, you know, dealing with climate change, but on the same hand, she's first in line when it comes to getting more money for Bath Ironworks and, mm -hmm. and Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. She supports the military budget. So there's a real contradiction there, right? Sure. So what do you think about that? Well, I've met uh, Shelley Pingree at a public appearance right after she'd gone to Washington, and she came back to uh, see her constituents, and I asked her that question. Um, you know, what are you going to do about military contracting and so forth? And she said, well, uh, you know, stopping the, the war machine, and she said, well, the, you get there, and they say, what are you going to do, throw 5,000 people out of work your first term of office? Um, so again, it goes, there's a long history to it. Um, there are military contracts in every congressional district in the United States, and those military contracts mean a lot of federal tax money flowing through a big corporation that gets lots and lots of bonuses and income from it, but then workers have decent jobs. And as we know, in our lifetime, the prospect of a decent job, especially in central Maine, meaning a job where one adult could work and keep a roof over the head of a family and feed everybody and, you know, uh, it's slim. So it's basing it on jobs and Democrats are just as scared of losing jobs in their district as Republicans are. Um, so they've kind of got them, you know, hamstrung where they can't say, oh, let's close down the war machine, the warship factory in Bath because what about all those jobs? Um, so then that leads us to this conversion campaign that you and I are a part of. Talk about that and talk about our response to this jobs issue. Well, one of the biggest learnings for me in the past 20 years has been the news that military contracting isn't a very good jobs program. Aside from any moral or even environmental considerations, it doesn't generate that many jobs. Um, economists at UMass Amherst have repeatedly used a model to see what a $1 billion um, investment in different sectors of the economy would be. Um, they even included just giving the taxpayers a rebate the way it was done in the Bush administration a couple times. And it turned out that investing in almost any other sector of the environment generates far more jobs because military contracting jobs tend to be very specialized. A lot of it's mechanized now and done with robots. Investing money in healthcare, investing money in education, investing money in uh, sustainable energy solutions such as building like a light rail uh, system or uh, components so that people could make their homes more energy efficient, any of those would generate sometimes twice as many or more than twice as many jobs um, as military contracting does. So that is another big, to me, missing piece of information. It's right out there. It's, ac it's peer-reviewed academic research that's refreshed from time to time every five years or so, and people just ignore it. Like that's not, they just say, oh, jobs. The discussion's over. Brown University at Ro in Rhode Island recently updated that very kind of study mm -hmm. and are saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Military spending is uh, capital intensive, meaning they burn up a lot of money, create not so many jobs. Every other kind of production, labor intensive. So if we're building offshore wind turbines, tidal power systems, you mentioned commuter rail systems, all that would help us with deal with this climate change reality that we're slamming into the wall here, mm. uh, and we'd even get more jobs in the process. It, to me, it's a win-win for labor unions, mm. for environmental groups, for the peace community, for social justice organizations. It's a win-win-win for everybody. And so it doesn't have to be that the workers are thrown out of out of work, you just make a transition, you have a training component, the workers are still paid as you're retrofitting. You know, they did it during World War II. The people that were making silk underwear soon were making parachutes and they ramped up overnight. Uh, you know, and there are many, you know, they were making trucks, now they're making tanks. So we could do the reverse and employ more people and deal with, begin to deal with climate change. Because if we don't change everything quickly overnight, 
we're finished. Well, some people don't even think climate change is actually real. They're like, yeah, weather changes. Um, I believe that June was the hottest month ever in recorded history, planet-wide. And, you know, things like Greenland's ice sheet melting much more rapidly than, well, you remember the climate scientists saying, we can't really predict how fast this will happen because it's sort of a self-feeding loop. But we'll tell you best case scenario, worst case scenario. Seems like we're in the worst case scenario in terms of how rapidly that's happening. Um, I was gonna say also, you and I both personally know workers at BIW who would love to see conversion happen. Um, I was going to maybe share a little bit of a, a letter that Patsy Messier just recently retired from BIW, but at the time in June when we had our press conference for the conversion campaign, um, she was still working there and she couldn't be there because she had to work, but she sent me this statement and part of it was, I believe BIW has the capacity with all the equipment and or people that are already there for the conversion to happen pretty easily. So this is somebody that worked at Bath Ironworks for decades. All it would take is the will by the people, and that's where you come in, meaning our conversion campaign. Um, you folks are doing important work by protesting. Please continue to stand up proudly. Uh, continue to engage BIW workers. Show them that you are just like them and are protecting the same way of life. Imagine wind turbine platforms, fast trains, or ships of peace, mercy ships, being built at BIW. I can just imagine the workers' pride then. Patsy Messier. There you go. And I can promise you, uh, you, you might remember I did a hunger strike about two years ago now when General Dynamics asked for a $60 million tax break from the state of Maine. And I was going down to the shipyard at noon and in the afternoon when they knocked off work. And I talked to a lot of workers uh, who told me that we would rather be doing something else. In fact, our cameraman, one of our cameramen here today, Peter Woodruff, 34 years at BIW, he passed a petition around some years ago and got 800 signatures. And he couldn't get to everybody, but he got 800 signatures of BIW workers saying, we want to build wind turbines. Mm -hmm. So we know just from our own experience that there's a constituency there, but it's not going to happen unless we get some help from certain s sectors of the society from the churches, from religious leaders. We see religious leaders recent, uh, recently speaking out about climate change, but they won't touch this issue because they're afraid it's gonna hurt the collection plate. Well, they need to speak up. They need to know that there are workers at BIW that would rather do something else. They also have children. They also have grandchildren. And they can see the writing on the wall, but they can't make this change without the community support. We need the environmental groups. We need labor unions to speak up. We need all kinds of organizations, the, everything from the Kiwanis Alliance Club. They need to start having speakers at their meetings, their luncheon meetings, about this very issue, the, these connections, if we hope to really protect the future generations. I think you're right. It's very hard for people to um, make a paradigm shift. Um, you know, most people are disinclined to change what they have believed in the past, and they're scared, and, and rightfully so, but um, the more information is freely shared and people really have uh, actionable facts at their fingertips, it's more likely that they can change their thinking, um, I believe. You know, the, uh, we know about the squad in Congress, some newly elected um, representatives in Congress that have said some truths that have been really um, unpopular and they've taken a lot of flack for it. I was super impressed with uh, Rashida Tlaib. She represents Mich uh, District Michigan. When they were dis uh, debating the Pentagon Appropriations Bill, she said, we're writing huge, huge checks are being written to Boeing and Lockheed Martin. She just said it out loud in Congress. It's so true, but it's really shocking when somebody speaks that truth. She could have just as well said general dynamics. Um, yeah. Amounts to the same thing. And as it turned out, uh, during that campaign that we had to oppose that $60 million tax break for general dynamics, uh, we, we had people all over the state, we, more than 100 letters to the editor to 25 newspapers across the state. So there were a lot of people engaged in this Indeed discussion. There were. Indeed there were. And the politicians were under a lot of pressure, especially here in the mid coast. And they wanted a way out. And so there was a lot of 
effort made to get the largest labor union at BIWS6 to endorse that bill. Mm. And so the union took a vote. And the vote was 50-50. Now, this is interesting, right? 50% of the union members that voted uh, said, no, we don't support this. We don't think they need the money, uh, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But I think it really indicates, again, that there are rumblings going on inside of that uh, that shipyard mm -hmm. that most people don't really want to recognize, they don't want to hear about. And in the end, we were able to cut $15 million off it. They only, they only got 45. Our collective campaign helped save the taxpayers $15 million, which mm -hmm. in the state of Maine is a lot of money. Yes. So anyway. I'll tell you a funny anecdote about that bill. You may be aware of it because you and my husband, Mark Roman, were at the legislature day after day. Um, the Democratic caucus had told their, representative, the, their um, members erroneously that that union had endorsed the bill. Well, um, our representative is Brad Farron, a Republican, and Mark saw him in the halls and went up and said, Senator Farron, I really want you to vote no on this. And Farron said to him, well, the union endorsed it. And Mark said, no, that is not true. They did not endorse it. And he got really nervous. And Brad Farron whipped out his cell phone, according to Mark, and started scrolling rapidly through it and said, well, they're going to endorse it. So it was really interesting to me that both Democrats and Republicans in the main legislature felt the same kind of pressure to do what the big union at BIW wanted them to do, and that there was some information, you know, some disinformation used to mislead them into thinking that they, they were. So that's an opening they, for us, isn't and it? And when they so. voted 50-50, when they didn't endorse that bill, you think that would have been a story, right? Mm. Nobody, at, least, yeah. <laughs> at least in the mid-coast, at least in the local papers in the mid-coast, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the TV might have been interested in that. It's a, it's a big story. Mm -hmm. Nobody reported it. Well, no. you wrote about it in your blog, and I wrote about it in my blog, but you're right. The Times Record, the Portland Press Herald, Kenny Beck Journal, nothing. Nobody. Silent. Why? Because General Dynamics is a big, big influence in this, you know, biggest employer in Maine. Try not to piss them off. <laughs> It's unbelievable. Not talking to you. You go out of your way to do something. Well, I'm just trying to, as they say, represent. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I got a son too, and I, uh, I, I've been clear for a long, long time that the best thing I can leave my son when I pass on, not money, not a fancy house or a car or anything else, but is a future on this planet. Mm -hmm. And every waking hour I spend trying to make things better, it's, it's all about that. So, and I think you're motivated by the same kind of thing. So uh, anyway, so what do you think that people, the public, who are concerned about this issue, climate catastrophe, what can they do to help right now? They can communicate about it. Um, if they call their congressional representatives and say that they're worried about it, it always seems like that didn't do anything, but believe me, they keep track of what, you know, there's a staff member making hash marks and saying, oh, we got this many calls on this subject. And um, so that's one thing that's pretty simple to do and pretty low cost. Um, people writing letters to the editor, as you pointed out, we had a great letter writing campaign around the tax break that uh, General Dynamics Bath Iron Works was asking for. Um, they can uh, talk to people. They can order a t-shirt and when people say, what is that, Maine Natural Guard? They can say, I'm trying to help people be aware of the Pentagon's carbon footprint and the fact that that's a much bigger security threat than, uh, you know, terrorists of any ilk. And um, I think that people can educate themselves. I think one of the most important things that I do is find my own information. I find people say, well, I listen to NPR, or I, you know, you've got to really look for some sources of information outside of the very narrow confines of American liberalism yeah. to, to know what's going on. There, there are great news sites that are available in English. There are great bloggers in other countries that you can, you know, read. I just uh, found a really great new author that I did not know about. Were you aware of Manuel Garcia, Jr.? He had an article in Counterpunch uh, in July 
that caught my eye because the title was Ye Cannot Swerve Me, Moby Dick and Climate Change. Mm. I'm a literature person. Moby Dick's one of my favorites of early uh, American literature. Uh, Mr. Garcia is a um, physicist who did a very long information-filled article about the science of climate change. How do we know that it is happening, that it is caused by humans, that, you know, where are we in that? And then uh, one of his, uh, toward the end, he, he began talking about governance and why we're not acting on it and what's it, you know, what's going on there. And then he, one of his uh, statements that stuck with me was, fossil fuels are the opiates in the addiction to war that would be the death of humanity by planet Earth's rejection of it. Um, the fact that we go to war for petroleum resources and then use a bunch of petroleum resources to conduct the war, and this, you know, uh, it's like a, a very bad cycle that we're stuck in, and we've just got to break out of it's it. It's like a drug addiction. Very much so. You know, when I think of the main natural guard, what I think about is that as we head into this wor swirling whirlwind of climate catastrophe, uh, we're going to have more and bigger storms, more and bigger weather incidents. Mm. And what I, I was recently invited to come speak at a, at a, uh, a conference in Florida, University of Florida, mm -hmm. uh, and I was surprised they invited me because it was a disaster relief conference. Educators, academics, people involved in the industry, and I thought, why in the world did they invite me to come? But what I learned was they wanted me to come and talk about this idea of converting the Pentagon into an organization like the Maine Natural Guard that would go and do rescue, recovery, and reconstruction after these events. Mm. Who's going to do that? Right. Where are the resources going to come from? Mm -hmm. when we have these massive cataclysmic storms yeah. because of this. And so we're not going to be able to afford to be out fighting wars when we have this huge human and ecological uh, severe conditions going on. So. I saw an article about a month ago about the um, Canadian military, the, the head of the Canadian military saying, we are being overwhelmed um, by the demands on us to help people dealing with exactly what you're talking about, flooding and cataclysmic weather events. We really need to retool, do a lot more training and put a lot more of our resources in that direction because at this point we aren't able to do it and that's what they expect their uh, army to do in Canada is, yeah. is help people when the floods are threatening so that was interesting to me I thought gee they seem to know what's going on one of the things I've been noticing too in collecting my articles and my reports is it's not just in the US the most recent one that I shared was hidden carbon costs of the everywhere war logistics geopolitical ecology and the carbon blueprint of the US military that was based on a study published in the Transactions of the Society of British Geographers by a group of um, academic researchers in the United Kingdom. Um, and they used, uh, they used um, uh, freedom of information requests to get at the, um, there's a thing called the U.S. Defense Logistics Agency, Energy, which they described as a large yet virtually unresearched sub-agency within the U.S. Department of Defense. Okay, we got it to is stop. Okay. All right, Lisa. Well, thank you. We're run out of time. Thanks okay. for coming on Thanks the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Bruce. it. My pleasure. Stay at it. And no, thank you for watching another edition of this issue. Until next time, can you see? Please get organized. Let's protect the future generations.